All right, AP Bio, this is your Mendelian Genetics and Gene Idea presentation. Um, so it's a Thursday morning here. So while you guys are enjoying your remote day, I'm getting some work done. So let's talk about this a little bit. So we talk about Mendel. I mean, they're not going to ask you who he was on the exam, but it's kind of important to know that, you know, he was an Austrian monk. He brought an experimental and quantitative approach to genetics. He bred pea plants. And why peas? Because it was easy to control them. You could create a self versus a cross pollination. Lots of varieties available in short generation time. So here was his experiment. Again, not too much about history of him, but what you really need to know is some of the terms like P is parental generation, which you, which was in this case is the true breeding. So you have purple and white, F1 first filial, F2 second. And so if you notice, if you look at this results, you know, you cross the P1s, you get all purple in the F1. But once you cross the F1s, you get this interesting ratio of three to one. And so he looked through seven characteristics, dominant versus recessive, dominant being expressed, recessive being hidden or masked. I hate that term masked, but really with the recessive traits, just not being expressed. And he found this consistent close to 3.3 to 1 ratio. So if you look on the right side of that chart, you see 3 to 1, 3.0, 1 to 1. So you get the idea. So what Mendel's principles came down to is that there are alternate versions of genes called alleles, and those cause variations in inherited characteristics. For each character, every organism inherits one allele from a parent. If two alleles are different, the dominant allele will be fully expressed and recessively will not be noticeable. And the law of segregation, which is the two alleles for each character, separate during gamete formation. So here's an allele, alternate version of a gene. Here's our law of segregation. So you've got a purple flower, you've got a white flower. You can see that the dominant allele and the recessive allele separate. And then, but if you go down to that F2 generation, you can see the, the separation of those alleles. And so really when we're talking about law of segregation, look at, like a monohybrid is kind of an easy way to remember that. So dominant, recessive, homozygous, heterozygous. I don't think I need to go over this, so you can pause this if you're not familiar. Again, phenotype, genotype, this is all review. So if you're not sure, you can pause it. Punnett squares, we did these in class. So if you want to feel free and do that Punnett square, you can do it on your own and check it with me. But if you cross, you're crossing two heterozygous, you're probably going to get a 3-1 ratio. Um, three purple to one white, so in terms of the um, phenotype. Test cross, we do one of these in class. Use the term if the dominant trait is unknown, so it's homozygous or heterozygous by crossing with the recessive. So I often use, you know, you've got black rabbits and white rabbits. You want to figure out the black rabbit. Again, in rabbit fur is not a simple dominant recessive, but if you wanted to see um, if the rabbit that you had was homozygous for black or heterozygous, you cross the white. You get all black, it's probably homozygous for black. You cross it and you get black and white, it's probably heterozygous. But again, rabbit fur color is probably not that simple. So there's our law of independent assortment. This is one that they ask you quite a bit. This is usually, I kind of like to use this thing. This is like a uh, dihybrid to test this. But each pair of alleles segregate independently during gamete formation. So color is separate from shape. And so why a dihybrid is because you're looking at two different traits. So color being one, shape being the other. So monohybrid cross is flower color, dihybrid cross is flower color and seed shape, and so you definitely see more of an independent assortment during a dihybrid. So there's an example of a dihybrid cross. Again, I am not going to be able to go through and work it out for you, but um, if you need practice, I'd encourage you to do the shortcut. When we're talking about the laws of probability and we talk about Mendelian inheritance, we need to talk about, first of all, that multiplication rule, which we've shown in class. You know, the probability that two or more independent events will occur together in a specific combination, you multiply the probabilities of the events. So probability of throwing two sixes, probability of having five boys in a row, or, you know, if we cross uh, those two genotypes, the probability of offspring with, you know, that particular type. And so if you throw two sixes, one six times one six is one thirty-six. Probably of having five boys in a row, a half, a half, a half, a half, a half is 132nd, and then one and one out of 16, which we did that. Addition rule, probability that two plus mutually exclusive events will occur, you add them together. So chance of throwing a die that will land on a four or a five, so you get one out of six, one out of six, two sixths, reduce it down to one third. Segregation of alleles and fertilization by chance events. So if we flip some coins, which we'll, doing, we'll be doing when we're looking at uh, some chi-square and cystic fibrosis. So speaking of the chi-square, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. Um, you'll have this PowerPoint. But the chi-square is used to examine the difference between an, an actual sample and a hypothetical. So if you roll a die, you get, two, you get snake eyes, probably due to chance. Possibly due to chance, probably not due to chance. And so using a chi-square, it's possible to discern whether experiments are valid or whether they're probably due to chance. And so compares two rival hypotheses, the null and the alternative. And so we establish a null and alternative, the, whole, the 
the null hypotenuse being re represented with an H to subscript 0 or an O, and the alternative H subscript A. The null hypothesis states that there is no relation between two variables. The findings are probably occurred by chance. An alternative hypothesis states that there's a relationship between two variables. The findings probably did not occur by chance. So I think my cheese will mold if I leave it out on the counter too long. So a null hypothesis would be something like if cheese is kept at room temperature for a week, then it'll have the same amount of mold on it as the same amount of cheese kept in a refrigerator. You know, no real reason for that. An alternative hypothesis, you know, if cheese is kept at room temperature for a week, then we'll have mold on it and the same amount of cheese kept refrigerated for a week. So you can see the difference between a null and alternative. The goal of the chi-square test is to either fail to reject or reject the null. If we fail to reject the null, then there's probably no re relationship between the two variables. If we reject the null, then the probability, then there probably is a relationship between the two variables. So the two variables and experimental results are probably not due to chance. So observe and expected. Observe is what you actually observe. Expected are your theoretical. That's usually your observed is what you actually collect. Your theoretical, your expected is what you would collect from, like if you did a Punnett square. How do you get the expected? If you're working with genetic problems, use a Punnett square. If you're working with another type of problem, use probability. Get your chi-square value. We flip a coin 200 times. So if we do that, we flip a coin 200 times. Uh, the null hypothesis is there is no statistics statistical significant difference between our coin flips and what we could expect it's by chance the coin is fair the there is a statistical difference between the two between our coin flips and the coin is not fair so there's our equation right observe minus expected divided by so observe minus expected squared divided by expected so if we flip a coin 200 times Right, it's good to have a table like this. So you've got your classes, observed, expected, O minus E, O minus E squared, O minus E squared divided by E, and there's your chi-square summation. There's your critical value table. We've talked about this. We tend to use the 0 0.05. And basically what a p-value is, it's predetermined choice how certain we are. The, sim the smaller the p-value, the more confident. So the, the smaller the value, the better. So degrees of freedom is the number of classes minus 1. So if we're looking at heads and tails, degree of freedom is 2 minus 1, which would give you 1. So if you go P, 0 0.05 or 1, it's 3.84. So fail to reject. If the chi-square value is less than the critical value, we fail to reject the null, right? So there is, the difference is not statistically significant. If the chi-square value is greater than or equal to the critical value, reject the null. So... In our example, the chi-square value calculates 1.28, which is less than. Therefore, we fail to reject our null. We reject alternative. We determine that our coin is fair. So it's not the results. Um, we reject the null hypothesis that, uh, or, or reject our alternative. Excuse me. All right, so we'll do that in class. So this is uh, just extending Mendelian genetics. Um, and so we'll talk about these in class. We have complete dominance, um, which is typically what we talked about, uh, heterozygote, homozygous, or dumb are indistinguishable. In incomplete dominance, this is where you get a appearance between the two. So red and white will give you pink. So these will not necessarily fall a Mendelian ratio of three to one. This might be like a one to two to one. Co-dominance, blood type. Uh, well, blood type is probably better for multiple allele. And then co-dominance is like where they're both expressed. And then polygenic, things like skin color. Then we got to talk about environmental effects. So nature versus nurture, both genetic and environmental factors influence phenotypes. So in hydrangeas, the uh, shade intensity of color depends on the acidity and aluminum content of the soil. And so that would not necessarily be directly linked to a genetic factor, but that would be environmental. When we are looking at Mendelian inheritance in humans, we do have a pedigree, and this is a diagram that shows relationships. And so the circles are the women or the XX donors. The males are the squares or the XY. If the tray is expressed, it's going to be shaded in. So here's a pedigree analysis of Widow's Peak. You can pause this and look through that. Pedigree analysis of PTC tasting. You can pause the video and analyze that. And so there's a practice problem. The pedigree traces the inheritance of alka tenuria, a biochemical disorder. I butchered that. Affected individuals are shaded. How does alka tenuria appear to be caused by dominant recessive? Well, if we're looking through this, it's present in pretty much every generation. And so um, we would have to go through and put in some letters. So if we put in some, it's probably not a symbol dominant. I have to work it out. But no, actually, no, it can't be a symbol dominant because Ann and Michael don't have it. They have an offspring that has it. If it's a symbol dominant, actually, no, it could be a symbol dominant. 
here's some genetic disorders, uh, albinism, Tay-Sachs, sickle cell, PKU, and then achondroplasia and Huntington's. These are multifactorial disorders, which are just not simple dominant recessive. So heart disease, diabetes, cancer, alcoholism, schizophrenia, bipolar, some mental illness. And so what's interesting is like uh, we look at genetic counseling. These are individuals that have to sit down with people who, for whatever reason, and have to go through and try to explain, like, this is a pundit square. This is what autosomal dominant is. This is what autosomal recessive is. So here's some practice problems for you. You can pause these and work them out on your own. I'm not going to do it here in the video. We may do them in class. And so here's some relationships among a single gene. So you got complete dominance, incomplete dominance, codominance, multiple allele, and pleiotropy. And then you got two more genes with epistasis and polygenic inheritance. So that was uh, all of Mendelian genetics in about 11 minutes. Again, uh, this is not, this is just supposed to supplement in class. Uh, hopefully a lot of this is a review. So again, if you got any questions, feel free to ask, watch the video, pause it where you need to. But this is me signing off from room 102, Tiffin's beautiful Southside. I will see you in another video.